And so first of all, sorry, no problem. First of all, I want to thank um, Cynthia and Lisa for inviting me to give this talk today. And they've really done a great job organizing our February Heart Health Awareness Month. So there's a lot of other events that are going on. So I invite you to kind of plug into our LHA website and see what's going on. I know we've got some yoga sessions to help people relax. And if this gets too boring, this might be another session where people can just relax and fall asleep. Um, I'll try to make this talk, you know, very um, not too data dense and have some nice pictures. And, you know, we'll try to break it down and talk about, you know, what is the microbiome? How is it related to your heart? And is this something that we could potentially harness to, combat multiple types of cardiovascular disease going forward. And so I'll start out with my uh, disclosures here, um, just so I'm in compliance with the university. And I saw Leslie Kennedy was nice enough to join. So Leslie, I'm uh, acknowledging my disclosure. So hopefully that keeps the university happy. But um, in particular to this talk, uh, my group does have a provisional patent where we're trying uh, a probiotic based therapy for right ventricular dysfunction. So I think a lot of us hear about the microbiome and we kind of have this idea that the microbiome is specifically bacteria that's located in the gut. And I think that's because that's the area that's been studied most intensively over the last couple decades, but the microbiome is actually a very complex ecosystem that has this symbiotic, sometimes not so symbiotic relationship with human health. And so there's a microbiome that's found in the mouth. We have the oral microbiome. There's a microbiome found in the urogenital tract. There's the GI microbiome, and then there's the skin microbiome. And it's actually an incredibly diverse system of single cell organisms that interact with us in multiple ways and shape our physiology. And a lot of the times we think that the microbiome is just bacteria, but it's actually um, bacteria, it's archaea, it's fungus, there's viruses, and there's specifically bacteriophage, which are viruses that are directed against bacteria. And different parasites can um, invade and disrupt our microbiome. And this is um, this complex interplay is what underlies a lot of disease processes that we're finding over in the last few years. And the microbiome is really popular in, in lay press and in research labs because there's a lot of inputs that can modulate the microbiome um, that are you know really important for our everyday life and um, can kind of spark some controversy or um, you know get people interested in, in a lot of different ways. So if you look from the day we're born, our birth mode actually affects our microbiome. So whether you're born via cesarean section or a vaginal delivery, that affects our microbiome. As we continue growing up in infancy, there's been findings that breast milk and breastfeeding has a different effect on the microbiome rather than just using formula. And the data suggests that breastfeeding may help promote a more healthy microbiome in our, in our infants. Um, and, you know, we're still learning about this, but there's certainly a lot of publications coming out there. We think about this aspect a lot in our life as our diet, what we're eating and how it is impacting our health. And there's a lot of cool papers coming out showing that what we eat is not just about our calories and not just about our cholesterol content. That's what we usually think about in cardiology, but it really shapes our gut microbiome and how that can go and interplay a lot of our disease processes. And I'll talk about that in particular. This picture kind of highlights a lot of green leafy vegetables that are high in fiber that are associated with improved or a more advantageous microbiome. And so maybe all of that talk that we found out when we were younger is to eat your vegetables from our, you know, parents and mothers in particular, is that, you know, they were right and eating our vegetables is good for our microbiome and not just about calories and cholesterol. Another big area of investigation is exercise. 
more exercise is better for us. And it comes back to the microbiome as well. So if you exercise, your gut microbiome seems to be more um, friendly to you, more anti-inflammatory. There's certainly diseases, and we'll talk about all of today, we'll be mostly focused on cardiovascular diseases that affect the microbiome, but certainly a lot of our colleagues in gastroenterology look at how inflammatory bowel disease impacts the microbiome and how that can impact disease severity. A lot of other diseases, um, one of our colleagues down in the integrative biology and physiology group, Xavier Ravello, published a wonderful paper this last year talking about the microbiome in um, Nash um, cirrhosis in his lab. So if you're interested in liver disease, I would highly recommend you look at that. Um, a lot of other things, certainly aging affects our microbiome. The drugs that, you know, we're prescribing for patients, you know, may or may not work as well based on their gut microbiome. And there's some interesting data coming out from our colleagues in oncology, suggesting that if you alter the microbiome, your chemotherapeutics may actually be more efficacious. And then finally, geography. Very interestingly, different parts of the world have different microbiomes, and it could be, you know, an interplay of a lot of this, you know, whether it's diet, exercise, um, exposure to different pharmaceuticals, but we do know different countries and inhabitants from different areas of the world have a different microbiome. So you can see how this would be very interesting to a lot of people and a lot of different aspects of human health get impacted by all of these things and, and they all can come back and impact the microbiome. And we'll kind of close on that, thinking about that when we move forward. So the, the microbiome is really interesting to me as a scientist because it has a weight of regulating systemic biology. And in particular, we're focusing on the gut microbiome, but in here, the, the bacteria that we have in our gut lumen can do a lot of things. So they can synthesize metabolites, and we're gonna talk about short chain fatty acids, um, which can be beneficial for anti-inflammatory properties, uh, promoting metabolism systemically, the bacteria obviously are in the lumen and they don't get out into our bloodstream or if they do, because what we say you have a leaky gut, um, they can actually activate the immune system and then that can cause a lot of inflammation. A lot of data, we'll, ta we'll talk about a paper later, but there's been a lot of data looking at neuroinflammation in the microbiome and in Parkinson's disease. So it's, it's quite interesting. Um, in addition to you know good, products and metabolites, the microbiome can also produce bad products. And we'll talk about that. One of them is called TMAO, and that is related to cardiovascular disease in multiple studies. And then the microbiome can also regulate how cells in the gut lumen are altered, how you're signaling through these cells. And this gets um, complicated and we'll talk about on the next slide is that there's good, bad mi microbiota and how it can interact with our physiology. So this is a, a complex figure that I'm certainly not going to go through in detail, but it's just really to highlight that the inflammatory cells in the GI system are really and strongly impacted by our microbiome. And there's been estimates that as much as 70 to 80 percent of our immune cells are actually localized in the gut. So that makes the gut the actual biggest inflammatory and immune cell organ in our body, you know, much more than what our lymph nodes are, our um, thymus. So you can imagine that having all of these different types of bacteria, if some bacterial products get into the lumen, you can activate multiple immune cell types, whether it's T cells, B cells, natural killer cells. And if you have, you know, fungus, you can get eosinophils, and then that can alter your T cells. And we'll talk about that down the road. And then that alters what types of T cells that you have distally and how maybe they may be more aggressive towards your body. Um, and that cut can cause problems. Now, not all bacteria in the gut are bad. There's actually some bacteria that actually stimulate some of our cells, like the goblet cells to help produce this layer of mucus that you can kind of see that's outlined in blue here. Um, and that is actually protective because that thicker 
layer of mucus can help prevent that translocation of the bacterial products into our stomach um, and into our lumen of our in intestines and hopefully prevent systemic inflammatory activation. And one of them that is classically known is the lactobacillus family of bacteria, which I think you'll read about on your yogurt um, that you eat as a probiotic. And we'll talk about that more later in the discussion. But I think this diagram very nicely highlights this complex interplay between our the microbes in our gut and our immune system. And knowing that 70 to 80% of our immune cells are in our gut really can understand how this microbiome can modulate systemic inflammation. And then again, the microbiome can affect systemic biology through its ability to generate metabolites. And we're gonna really discuss this metabolite TMAO. And that comes back to this inter interesting interplay between our diet, what bacteria are in our gut, and how that is generating and interplaying with bile acids in our liver. And what has been shown is that too much of this TMAO is actually has a really adverse effect clinically or a lot of nice associations between chronic kidney disease, atherosclerosis, that can lead to heart attacks, metabolic syndrome, and type two diabetes. And these kind of players here are what we always get concerned about in cardiovascular disease, because once these guys start adding up on top of each other, then it gets very hard to treat patients. Um, and then, you know, our, a lot of our medicines don't actually go back to this uh, microbiome that we know very well. And this may be a new way for us to combat a lot of diseases at once if we're very effective. So, I want to start out talking about TMAO and some manuscripts that have been published in the last six to seven years. So this is a manuscript published in, in Cell, which used a lot of human data to kind of interrogate how this metabolite TMAO can alter our platelets in our blood, and that can alter atherosclerosis, heart attacks, and strokes. And so basically what this group did is they took a, a large cohort of patients, over 4,000 here, and they separated them just based on the blood levels of this product, TMAO. And what they saw is that the higher your TMAO levels were, the higher likelihood that you had of either having a myocardial infarction or a stroke. Um, so more of this was bad and they did some assays in vitro to say that if you take TMAO and give it to platelets and then give them some stimuli that make them more active, TMAO enhances their platelet activity. So what these authors kind of wanted to conclude was that this, our gut microbiome is modulated by what we eat. In particular, they were talking about phosphatidylcholine, which is found in a lot of red meats that we see. And that is converted into this metabolite TMA by your gut microbiome. And then they can also convert that to TMAO. And then that can go out into your systemic circulation and that activates platelets. And then that platelet reactivity is what can go from having just um, a slightly clogged artery to a uh, clogged artery now with platelet activation and a actual clot that forms. And that is the underlying basis for a heart attack or a stroke. So you can start to see that, yes, what we eat modulates our microbiome and our microbiome modulates um, systemic processes. And that can be associated with, you know, two devastating diseases, myocardial infarction and stroke. So we're starting to see some very interesting cardiovascular associations. Now, this hasn't only been studied in these two diseases, it's been studied in heart failure as well, another very large problem for us. And what this was a study performed at the Cleveland Clinic, where they looked at patients that had high and low TMAO levels based on just an arbitrary cutoff of five here in their table, but then they broke it down by quartiles. And what they found is that the people with higher levels of TMAO in general, you know, had some differences in particular, they had worse kidney function, they had 
higher BNP, which is a lab value that we use to show that you know they have abnormalities in cardiac function. Um, they were also more likely to have diabetes. And when they actually looked at the survival in this cohort of patients, again, you see this nice dose response where the higher levels of TMAO are actually associated with very poor prognosis. So in this cohort, if you were in the highest level of TMAO, your five-year survival was just barely 50% versus if your TMAO, TMAO levels were reasonable, you know, you had, um, you know, an 85% mortality, I mean, survival rate over here. So now we start to see this has really important implications in very prevalent cardiovascular diseases and their long-term survival um, with that. So this is a very exciting area for us to potentially tap into and, and target. And so, you know, can we actually target this? That is another question because a lot of these studies I've talked about are just association studies, but a paper just published a couple of years ago showed that if you take um, an inhibitor, a small molecule inhibitor, it's called this IMC, and that is basically a way that prevents bacteria from synthesizing um, TMAO, and that will mitigate that increase in TMAO. And then they took animals and then exposed them to uh, cardiac stressor, aortic banding, and saw how that affected them. And so importantly, what they showed is that if you give these animals this IMC, you can detect it in their colon. So it's getting into their GI tract and having an effect. And then these animals basically had um, almost no TMAO levels. And you compared that to the animals that got just um, a regular choline diet without this inhibitor, you really basically abolished the levels of TMAO. Now, the question is, did that have an effect on heart function? It certainly did. Out here, if you watch as these animals go over time, animals that were given this drug that inhibited TMAO production had a, a better heart function 15 weeks later, and their plasma BNP, which again is a marker of cardiac stress, also came back down. Um, and that's with no other medical therapy. So that really is suggestive that this is an area that we could target to hopefully either preserve cardiac function or maybe enhance. They didn't quite show that in this study, but you know, a completely new and novel avenue to combat uh, heart failure. So next I wanna talk about what are potentially good things that the microbiome is supplying us and that's these short chain fatty acids. And this is a, kind of a diagram that I like that shows that if you're having you know, carbohydrates that are rich and complex um, carbohydrates in particular, you have fermentation of these by your microbiome, and then those can be used to synthesize intermediates that make these short chain fatty acids, butyrate, acetate, and propionate. And now these three short chain fatty acids in general are viewed as good things. So they have very positive effects in distal organs over here. Um, in the brain, it seems to modulate neuronal inflammation and the lungs also can modulate inflammation and may have effect in asthma. Um, in the pancreas, it seems to help with beta cells. And so that helps with the cells that are producing insulin. And that may help, you know, with our diabetes patients. They also have an uh, effect on the genetic imprinting in bone marrow hematopoietic stem cells. And now we're learning more in the last few years is that these hematopoietic stem cells that have mutations or alterations have a big role in cardiovascular disease as well. And um, very interestingly, it also can modulate the epigenetic imprinting on tissues in utero. So this is a, a picture here of a, a pregnant woman. And what they're trying to um, depict is that women that have a diet rich in high fiber, high vegetables, um, generally have a more favorable microbiome. And then you generate a lot more of these short chain fatty acids, and then those go into the portal vein, and then they can actually go into uh, the infant and have a beneficial effect on the infant. So now you can imagine, now we're talking about 
the microbiome impacting one person. And now maybe it can impact the next generation of uh, people by imprinting what's going on um, on a baby in utero, depending on what the mom eats and what the microbiome of the mom is. So now we're, we're thinking about impacting one person and then a second generation. So you can certainly see how this may be altering um, health over generations as we start watching our diet basically get worse over the last 15 years and a reduction in high fiber diet. Maybe that is, you know, a contributor to why we're seeing more cardiovascular disease, more ob obesity, more type two diabetes over the last few years as well. Um, certainly remains to be proven, but it's certainly fun to hypothesize and think about. And there's nice experimental data looking at short chain fatty acids and coronary artery disease. Here's a paper that was published just a couple of years ago where they took animals that were genetically modified to have a higher propensity of developing coronary disease or systemic atherosclerosis. And they treated them with propionate, which is this um, three chain, three carbon chain, short chain fatty acid. And what they showed here is just a bunch of flow cytometry data in graph format is that you reduce the inflammatory cells in the aorta um, in these animals that were treated with short chain fatty acids. And then if you look over here on the right side, they showed here's the actual animals aorta here. So all this red is, is basically lipid and that's bad because it's um, starting atherosclerosis. But if you treated these animals with a short chain fatty acid, you get rid of that. That's quantitated over here. I think this is kind of a, a, a cool image where you can see that these animals treated with a short chain fatty acid um, actually have less of a kind of obstruction of their vessels than animals that weren't. And that's quantitated here. So this short chain fatty acid seems to be preventing atherosclerosis, which is a contributor again to myocardial infarction, stroke, um, peripheral arterial disease. And also that seems to have beneficial effects on the heart because these animals had less fibrosis. So potentially the authors were trying to argue that less coronary disease, less fibrosis in these animals. So this is somewhere where I think this is, you know, a good thing that we're having a good microbiome product. And then these authors um, also show that in another model where you infused uh, a hormone to cause hypertension, that this short chain fatty acid also had beneficial effects. So again, flow cytometry data here, and these authors showed that this short chain fatty acid prevented accumulation of different um, types of CD4 and CD8 T cells and macrophage in the heart. And that was associated um, with less fibrosis and less fibroblast proliferation. So here's a stain for fibronectin, a specific type of extracellular matrix protein. So when you have hypertension that kind of deposits in your heart and that in general we think is a bad thing. And then if you give the animals this short chain fatty acid, you can prevent that, you can prevent um, fibrosis around the vessels here. And then down here is there's a reduction in the number of fibroblasts. So these kind of like little pink cells here that are labeled are fibroblast and they go down and the animals treated with the short chain fatty acid. So, you know, in two different disease states, that's really common and prevalent for us as cardiologists, hypertension and coronary disease, these short chain fatty acids seem to be beneficial in animal models. And obviously our challenge will be, can we translate that to humans? And certainly we're hoping to see that from our colleagues around the world. So next I wanna shift gears a little bit and talk about the immune mediated mechanisms of the microbiome and cardiac disease. And again, I just wanted to highlight this figure to say, yes, this is very complicated. All of these microbes can go and activate the immune system and that can have distant effects. And over here on the right is basically a, a summary figure of a paper, which I thought was really cool, where they basically show that this specific bacteria, Bacteroides 
um, theta here was able to activate the immune system and it had a protein that looked like a, a heart protein. And so that told our, the immune system and these animals that, hey, this is a bad protein, you need to go and clear it out. So these immune system, um, immune cells actually went and attacked the animal's hearts. And then that caused animals to have a severe myocarditis, severe cardiac dysfunction and, and um, increased mortality. And they show that if you alter the microbiome, you can mitigate this. So a completely novel way for us to think about inflammatory myocarditis. And so here's just really brief data to highlight this. So these authors show that if you put animals in a germ-free environment or SPF, which is a different type of um, housing, but the germ-free animals, um, if you give them this genetic modification to increase their likelihood of autoimmune um, myocarditis had a hundred percent survival out to 20 weeks. And then the animals in the regular housing actually had about a 50% mortality rate. You can see here on the gross images, the germ-free heart is not big and dysfunctional. You can see here on our histology, the germ-free heart has less um, immune cell infiltration. And then they said, okay, let's really go and prove that this is the microbiome. So what they did is to take the animals that were in this um, SPF environment and then treated them with antibiotics, streptomycin, vancomycin, and then metronidazole, and then basically got rid of the entire microbiome in their gut and got rid of these potentially bad um, bacteria. And they showed that yes, these animals had 100% survival under these conditions. And they actually went and looked at that bad bacteria that was expressing this protein that informed our immune system or the mice's immune system to attack the heart. And they basically helped get rid of a lot of that. And in particular, if they looked at the, the combination here, um, which had 100% survival, they almost completely got rid of that um, genetic trigger for the immune system. So, you know, now we're thinking about autoimmune myocarditis, which we don't really have a great treatment for currently besides blasting people with immune suppression and that has its own complications. Now we're showing, hey, maybe you can actually modulate the microbiome and that can slow down this. And so maybe we can synergize these approaches by saying, here's a immune suppression and then here's some antibiotics or some type of microbiome targeted therapy to basically mitigate this autoimmune disease and help improve cardiac function. Okay, so I wanna take uh, another twist here and start thinking about bile acids as a potential modulator of cardiac disease. So bile acid uh, metabolism is a, a complex interplay between what goes on in the liver, what goes on in the gut, and then what goes back on in the liver. So bile acids are um, predominantly synthesized and we call them uh, primary bile acids in the liver. And then they go into the gut and then they become secondary bile acids here by different um, enzymatic reactions for bacteria in our gut. Um, you know, we've developed this symbiotic relationship, so they make um, bile acids, and then they can go and get conjugated in the liver to make these conjugated bile acids that can have effects systemically. And there is some interesting data that dysregulation of this process can certainly be associated with worse cardiac function. So this is a paper published in 2017 where they looked at this ratio of primary to secondary bile acids. And again, the secondary bile acids are the ones that are generated by our microbiome. And basically what they showed is that if you disrupt this um, equilibrium, and that is most likely due to altered microbiome is that patients with heart failure have altered um, bile acid equilibrium so that there seems to be more secondary over primary bile acids. And this is actually important because if you look at this um, and you look at how it impacts survival, the patients that had the most disrupted or in tertile three bile acid um, ratio had the worst survival out of 
anybody. And again, this is association study. It could be because the heart is impacted and that's impacting the liver. Um, but there was actually a really cool paper published um, a few years ago showing that if you make a mouse that is altered in its bile acid metabolism, so it, it generates too many bile acids, um, these mice actually start to develop cardiac dysfunction directly. And that is associated with altered programming of the fatty acid metabolism pathway. And in our hearts, we use and burn fatty acid as our usually our primary fuel source. So if you have too many bile acids around, that seems to depress our fuel source and, and uh, disrupts our cardiac function. But interestingly, these authors show that if you give this drug cholestyramine, which basically acts as a sink to suck up all these bile acids in the GI tract, you can actually reduce your bile acid levels and improve cardiac function. And that was associated with um, a reprogram of cardiac fatty acid proteins. So this again shows us that if you're altering at least bile acids, which are a product of the microbiome, you can directly compromise cardiac function. But if you combat that, you can actually improve um, cardiac function and improve um, cardiac metabolism. So again, another product of our microbiome that can cause distal effects. But not all bile acids are bad. Um, and so there was also a, a nice study published last year in circulation research um, that actually looked at the relationship between bile acids, intermittent fasting, and uh, hypertension. And if you remember in the beginning of the talk, I said our diet modulates our microbiome. And what these authors showed that is if you intermittently fast different types of rats that are exposed to are predisposed to having hypertension, you can change their microbiome that increases um, some beneficial bile acids, which induce vasodilation and that causes a reduction in blood pressure. Um, and then these guys showed here, there's a lot of dysregulation of the bile acid homeostasis and hypertensive animals. But if you give them colic acid, which is here, which um, is proposed to be a good bile acid or an anti-inflammatory bile acid with vasodilatation, you can actually bring blood pressure down significantly um, in animals that have genetically predis predisposition to having hypertension. Um, and again, so this gets back to our, our theme that there are multiple inputs into the microbiome and then that has distal effects. And I kind of wanted to highlight this too, is because it kind of highlights how complex this biology is because we're just showing that too many bile acids are bad, but then this shows us that some bile acids are actually probably good. So we need to understand these ratios and how they can potentially be um, harvested or taken for potential therapeutic purposes moving forward. Now, the disease that I spend my life studying is pulmonary arterial hypertension, and that's high blood pressure in the arteries and the lungs, not like in the systemic side when you think when you go get your blood pressure at the pharmacy or at the doctor's office. And uh, a nice study published last year showed that patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension have a distinct microbiome as compared to control patients. And here's just a couple different ways of quantitating their microbiome. And what these authors showed is that there's some bacterial species that are enriched in PAH and hypothesized that maybe these are bad bacteria and some bacterial species that are reduced in PAH and maybe these are good bacteria um, and that this could be a contributor to the disease process. Now in my lab, we got interested in this and um, Dr. Prisco published a paper last year showing that if you take animals that have pulmonary hypertension and you fast intermittently fast them, you actually change their microbiome here um, and is quantitated here. And if you look, there's an increased abundance of this good bacteria lactobacillus caused by intermittent fasting. So um, we think that that could be playing an effect. 
And then we looked at how intermittent fasting regulated microbiome products in the right side of the heart, because that's the right side of the heart is what fails in pulmonary hypertension. We showed that animals with disease had a increased abundance of some bile acids and a lot of uh, amino acid uh, metabolites, which are another byproduct of the microbiome. And if you intermittently fasted these animals, you prevented the accumulation of many of these. Now, all of that biochemistry is really cool and fun to me because I'm a biochemist, but you know what people want to know is, do you actually make the heart better? And indeed, um, Sasha showed very nicely that if you intermittently fast these animals, the heart function gets better um, based on a couple echo parameters. And then we do a, a catheterization based parameter. And then these animals also had less pathological hypertrophy of the heart at the whole organ level and then at the cardiomyocyte level. Um, so this, you know, suggested that one other potential benefit of intermittent fasting um, was to modulate the microbiome and made the, the heart function better in pulmonary hypertension. And so Dr. Prisco is following up on this. And um, what she did was to actually directly test, is it the lactobacillus that we saw in the animals that made heart function better. So what she did was to just let animals eat whatever they wanted to eat whenever they wanted to eat, but then gave them um, lactobacillus treatment. And amazingly, what she saw was that the lactobacillus treatment basically completely recapitulated the beneficial effects of intermittent fasting on cardiac function. So both echo derived and catheterization derived measures of heart function were improved just by giving lactobacillus. So, you know, this is another way that we could potentially modulate the microbiome is just to give back a bunch of the good bacteria. Now, um, we wanted to see is this happening in other sites of heart failure. And in particular, the more common type is left heart failure. And another group showed um, quite a few years ago is that if you give lactobacillus in animals that had a coronary artery ligation or a big heart attack that compromised their heart function, um, you could see that giving them lactobacillus, they called this GR1, actually improved. So the slope of this line, the steeper it is, the better the heart contracts, actually improved their contractility and um, improved their relaxation capabilities um, as shown here. And then they also augmented their uh, preload recruited stroke work, um, which is just kind of a fancy hemodynamic measure of cardiac function. And they showed that the lactobacillus was much better than animals that didn't get treated with lactobacillus. So, uh, you know, pretty incredible that you can just give some animals the right bacteria, and it seems to really enhance both right and left-sided heart function. Now, we're actually testing this in our PAH patients, because I think when we do a lot of these studies in the lab, it's actually pretty easy because all of our animals are genetically identical and they all eat the same food. But when we, what we actually try to do is figure stuff out and actually help people. And Dr. Thenepin's taking this in the, the next level by doing a clinical trial of um, an IMT, which is an intestinal microbiota transplant for pulmonary arterial hypertension patients. And He's already enrolled three patients that have started this microbiome transplant um, protocol. No adverse effects have been found. Thankfully, um, we haven't any assessment of engraftment or efficacy, but it's very promising that we're able to get three patients in. And then hopefully by the end of uh, this calendar year, we'll know, does this actually change the microbiome? And does that chain associated with any improvements in heart function or symptoms in, in pulmonary arterial hypertension patients? Now, certainly we're not the only people in the world to think about this. And some of these probiotics have actually been assessed by other groups. And so this is a clinical trial called the gut heart trial. Um, and what these uh, groups of patients um, they took heart failure patients and then give them standard of care. They give them rifaximin, which is an antibiotic that can alter the microbiome. And they gave them Saccharomyces, a probiotic that can also um, 
alter the microbiome. And this is actually not a bacteria, this is a fungus, but what they showed is that unfortunately they didn't really significantly change the microbiome with their um, interventions. And um, that was associated with no change in cardiac function. So, you know, here's, you know, maybe this is not the right way to target the microbiome. Maybe we need, you know, a multidisciplinary and uh, intervention, or maybe Saccharomyces is just not the right type of good organism in, in heart failure. But, you know, it was done, it was safe. Unfortunately, it wasn't positive. Um, interestingly, another small clinical trial um, did a, a similar probiotic where they gave um, patients lactobacillus. And what they did in, is they kind of combined caloric restriction plus a probiotic. So, um, kind of two hits at the microbiome. And what they showed is that if you did a probiotic plus caloric restriction, you're able to significantly reduce the inflammatory marker interleukin-1 beta and LPS. And then those were significantly different from just the placebo control, which basically had no, no change. So this, you know, is interesting because it seems like if we hit the microbiome from a couple different arms, we may actually have more efficacy. Um, we don't have any long-term data because this was just a small group of patients that were analyzed 12 weeks later, but we do know that higher levels of these inflammatory markers are associated with poor outcomes. So, you know, I guess I'll try to close this off relatively quickly and think, you know, is, can we restore the microbiome to correct our heart? And there's a lot of groups that are investigating this process right now. Um, people are doing microbiome disruption after open heart surgery in the Netherlands. In China, they're looking at uh, uh, microbiome transplant, dietary intervention, and probiotics in hypertension as a way to treat this. Colleagues in Pittsburgh are using chlorhexidine and oral nitrate to alter the oral microbiome. As I said, Dr. Thenepin is doing his clinical trial here at the University of Minnesota, looking at microbiome transplant in pulmonary arterial hypertension. And then colleagues in Brazil are actually using probiotics in diabetic cardiomyopathy uh, with excess weight gain. So they're, I think they're probably trying to enrich their population to have a, a better effect. So certainly around the world, this idea is taking place and hopefully we'll find out in the next five to 10 years if this is truly a way to improve our heart health. And finally, I guess, I want to close back thinking about how we may be able to harness this going forward and thinking about the fact that there are multiple inputs that modulate the microbiome. So, you know, we may not just be able to do a microbiome transplant. We may have to say, if we really want to affect microbiome in adults, you need to do a microbiome transplant and get them on an exercise program or a microbiome transplant with diet, or we may have to give them antibiotics to get rid of their bad microbes, give them the microbiome transplant and repopulate their gut flora. So I think, you know, everything in the lab is always easier than what it is in humans. And when we start trying this in humans, we may have to be a little bit more um, proactive about hitting our microbiome at multiple angles to have the most long lasting effects and hopefully improve cardiac function, alter atherosclerosis, coronary disease, stroke, heart failure, um, and improve our patients' outcomes moving forward. Um, and with that, I will stop and I'll be happy to take any questions that anybody has. And thank you all for joining us. Um, and let's, let's chat, I guess. Okay. Um, yeah, if you want to um, put your questions in the chat or you can raise your hand or if you'd like, um, use the Q&A app to um, ask questions. Anyone? Well, I'll, I'll just start with one question. Um, how, what was it that started sparking um, this, this interest in um, the gut biome and its relationship to, to various health um, questions? What was the, what was that breakthrough moment? Uh, I mean, I think it was a lot of basic science that came into it, understanding, you know, that 
we're finding all these microbes um, in the gut. And then a lot of people, you know, clearly put together that 70% of our immune, 70 to 80% of our immune cells are in our gut. So they started, you know, just looking into this and finding this. And then we started having breakthroughs and how we could actually interrogate this. So with better genetics, now we can actually sequence people's microbiome. And now, you know, as soon as somebody publishes something and it looks really promising, then we all just copy each other, right? We say, oh, that worked in your disease. I want to look at my disease. And, and that's kind of how we, we get going. And um, it's been an amazing, um, if you look at microbiome publications in the last, you know, five years, they're up by like uh, 500%. Um, so we have better tools to do it. And it all started, you know, with basic science, just starting to do this. And then everybody kind of adds on their own little bit. Um, you know, it's kind of like vaccines, you know, we started out with MRNA knowing it, and now we have vaccines. So we all just build on little by little, and then our technology gets here and makes things better. Uh, okay, uh, we have a question um, in the chat. How do they measure the TMAO in humans? Okay. Um, so that's just a blood test, Lisa. So they just take uh, blood, spin it down, and then we have a, a thing called um, mass spectrometry. And it basically says, what's the mass to charge ratio of TMAO? And then that gives us a quantitative measure. So, you know, hopefully I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, in the next 10 years, people are getting their TMAO measured as a way to, you know, per, you know potentially risk stratify people for disease Um you know, whether it's coronary disease or what. And I think, you know, I think Jeremy Van Hoft I saw is joined. So maybe him will be a prevention cardiologist. We'll start harnessing this and we can use it as a diagnostic tool as well. And then a uh, question in the Q&A, this is pretty broad. Um, what would be the best thing to do for people in general? What is the best diet? Maybe you can just get, um, direct people in a way that they can find out what kind of diet is best for them. If you have any suggestions for that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the best diet that we know based on our literature is probably, um, probably a high fiber, high vegetable diet. Um, and that seems to be a beneficial effect, um, for a lot of different reasons. So that's probably what I would do, but there's also, you know, a lot of people like eating meat, including myself. So you may want to, you know, consider looking at Mediterranean diet. Um, and those are kind of just good Google searches that you can look. Uh, there's a lot of benefits for fasting and intermittent fasting, like Jeremy Van Toff uh, told us last year. Um, so, you know, find whatever works for you. You know, if you can exercise as much as you can and lose weight, your life will be better. Uh, another one. Um everyone wants a quick fix. What would you say based on what we know now would be the top three things we should do to start uh, rever I, oh, reversing the bad and making our heart health better? Yeah. Um, you know, these are lifestyle changes that are extraordinarily difficult, unfortunately. So I'll go back to the same thing. If you can exercise more, eat less, restrict the time that you're eating and eat more green leafy vegetables, that will help your heart more than any special pill or any microbiome transplant uh, I could prescribe, I would say. Uh, another from, oh, from Leslie Kennedy. I have always been skeptical on the phrase probiotic for yogurt. Is that a real thing or are all yogurts the same? Um, yeah, so I'm skeptical as well, Leslie, because, um, you know, people can put in lactobacillus into yogurt and I don't know how well it actually lives, right? It's like sitting in your refrigerator. I guess it might live better if you just leave it out on your counter for a few hours, but then it actually has to get through your gut, right? So your stomach is a pH of one. So somehow you have to protect the lactobacillus from getting killed in your gut to actually go down into your um, intestine and, and repopulate it. So that's um, most likely why lactobacillus based probiotics or whatever probiotics that you get from yogurt don't really have a huge effect, um, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, we know location plays, this is from Jessica Velgoth. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. We know location plays a part in microbiome diversity. Uh, and she has a link to a case study. Um, have you and colleagues across the field examined the microbiome of people with pulmonary hypertension based on these specific locations? 
Um, and no, it's a great question. And unfortunately we haven't. So, you know, we have, I think now there's two papers in press that have looked at microbiome. One is from the University of Florida um, and one is from somewhere in Europe. Um, and, you know, we're working on describing that here and not really me, it's Dr. Thenepens who's leading that. So he deserves all the credit. Um, but, you know, again, this is predominantly of, I would say, people in Minnesota or Northern European ancestry. So we don't have any analysis of what it's like in Asia, what it's like in Africa or South America. But, you know, as this technology becomes more and more readily available, um, certainly we can understand how the microbiome and geological um, location are interplayed and intertwined. Uh, another question from Lisa. Um, I have seen the studies about poop pills and how that completely changes someone that is having major gut issues. How does this work? Uh, I think I think Lisa is referring to uh, the poop pills as like the pills with the um, they, what they do is they capsulize different bacteria from the gut and then you take those and those uh, with the capsule can get through the stomach's acidity and, and graft a little bit better into the um, intestine and change the microbiome. And it, it certainly does work. And at the University of Minnesota, our, our colleagues in gastroenterology actually pioneered this with a severe infection called Clostridium difficile. So that's when too much of this bad, bad bacteria takes over in your gut and it can actually kill people. And what our colleagues here in gastroenterology did is they actually did a, a fecal transplant and showed that they can reverse that and um, restore the microbiome. So um, basically these poop pills are uh, good, good microbiome pat, basically capsulated and then it goes into your gut and hopefully can restore that balance of getting rid of the bad ones and um, reinforcing the good ones. Okay. And let's see another question from Anonymous. Uh, is there any advantage to taking an over-the-counter probiotic daily? I don't think there's any clear data that it is going to help you. Um, if you're doing it, that's fine. Um, if you uh, are hoping for something, I would say monumental, I would not you know, bank on that. But that being said, some people are swear by probiotics and maybe they you know, are more able to engraft the probiotic. Um, and that is, you know, something that, you know, you can, um, you know, maybe your somebody will be better at that based on what they eat in their diet and everything. Uh, another question from Leslie Kennedy. I admit I love my coffee and a nice glass of wine. I'm with you, Leslie, on that one. How bad are these acids for the microbiome? You know, Leslie, I'm in the same boat. I love my coffee and I love my wine. Um, and how bad are they for the microbiome? So the acidity actually doesn't really affect your microbiome, right? Because you, the acidity changes once you get into the intestine. Um, so that, you know, may not be great for your stomach lining, but by the time they get down to the way your microbiome live, it, it hasn't um, making a big impact. I guess the only thing is that coffee is a stimulant. So it can promote faster transit time, you know, through your GI tract. And so that may alter your microbiome more um, than say wine, but wine does have some alcohol. Um, but I haven't seen any clear data saying that these are bad. So, you know, just as with anything, anything good in moderation is good, Leslie. So keep drinking your coffee and uh, we'll cheers to a glass of wine soon. <laughs> Uh, last call. Oh, we have one more from Lisa. Um, could you touch on the fasting part and how that would benefit us? Can you also say if men or women have better microbiome? <laughs> uh oh. And how does that affect heart heart attack rates? Yeah. So, um, so the fasting part, I would say, um, it is beneficial for us via the microbiome, but it also has a lot of other effects um, by stimulating metabolism. And that seems to be independent of the microbiome. And we don't know why, but that's the only way we've ever been able to actually extend lifespan in animals is just by fasting them or caloric restricting them. So um, nobody's actually 
that I can think of shown that uh, if you get rid of the microbiome completely, that you abolish that um, protective effect. You can take a animal that had fasting and do a fecal transplant into another animal's. And so their microbiome can actually have a beneficial effect on another one. So it does seem to be kind of a transferable thing. Um, so that's not that applicable for us as humans, unfortunately. So just, I guess you can fast and uh, do that. Um, so do men or women have microbiome? I would say women probably do because women always live longer than men. And uh, if like, like most men like me are not very good at uh, eating the right food. So I would say women in general probably have a better microbiome. Um, and does that affect heart attack rates? Um, potentially. Um, I don't think it's been studied in, in detail, but it, it certainly may affect them. Um, but there's a lot of problems between differences between men and women and how they present their symptoms with a heart attack that we unfortunately uh, don't treat women as aggressively as we should. But does it come back to the microbiome? I haven't seen any clear evidence that it does, but I would say women have better microbiome and my wife and daughters will agree with me. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, again, we're kind of at the last call here. If anyone's got another question, let's go ahead and get it on the board. Oh, uh, there we have one from, again, from Jessica Velguth. Again, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Could uh, CERT-1 be activated by IF and lead to improvements in cardiac health? Um, yeah, so CERT-1 certainly can be. There's a lot of interesting data um, in particular at the molecular level, looking at AMP kinase, and that leads to improvements in cardiac um, function. And so the, the, cert, the cert twins are uh, important proteins in mitochondrial health and function. Um, and so I would say that there, I think I remember a paper showing CERT3 is activated. I don't know if CERT1 off the top of my head, but um, I think the better data based on um, C. elegans work um, is that AMP kinase is the more important player of modulating the cardiovascular effects of um, intermittent fasting. Okay. Oh, um, this is just one general question. Uh, there was a question asking if the recording will be available later. Yes, we will make this uh, available from, from our website. Okay. Looks like we may be at the end here. Thank you so much, Kurt, for taking the time to give us this great talk. It's very, very interesting. Um, and I hope uh, I hope we'll hear more about your research going forward. Sure, happy. Well, thanks for inviting me and thanks everybody for joining me. And uh, remember your microbiome uh, is affecting everything that you do. So eat healthy and exercise. Okay, great advice. All right, hey. bye. Bye-bye.